Alright, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sotko here. Welcome back to the channel. Got a whole bunch of good crypto news stuff for you today. And the first thing I want to talk about is that $190 million in crypto is gone forever and how Canada's biggest Bitcoin exchange lost it all. Well, that title is uh, slightly misleading. Let me correct it just a tiny little bit. It's not necessarily gone forever and they didn't lose it all. It's just sort of... Uh, kind of hard to get to at the moment and uh the article will explain that a little bit better so quadrica uh, cx the largest bitcoin exchange in canada has lost 190 million worth of crypto after it lost access to its cold storage wallet so this is something exchanges don't really do enough in my opinion is have the majority of their crypto or a lot of it in cold storage and uh, this time well it, it kind of backfired so it just goes to show how uh, highly secure the cold storage is right uh so an affidavit uh, affidavit filed on january 31st with the supreme court of nova scotia revealed that 190 million in bitcoin uh bch uh bch uh, sv uh, bitcoin gold litecoin and ethereum were lost so the affidavit first filed on by coindesk was filed by jennifer robertson the, the widow of quadriga uh, cx founder and ceo gerald cotton According to the death certificate included in the affidavit, Cotton passed away in India after suffering from Crohn's disease. The death of Gerald Cotton was disclosed by the exchange in early January. So she stated that Cotton was solely in control of storing user funds in cold storage wallets. In crypto, cold storage refers to a uh, wallet that's not connected to the Internet. Usually, uh, major digital asset exchanges like Binance and Coinbase store a large portion of their funds in cold storage to prevent hacking attacks and security breaches. However, there is often an infrastructure in place in the form of a multi-signature system uh, to ensure that the exchange can still withdraw funds under the most unlikely circumstances. In the case of Quadriga, CX, the founder and CEO, was solely responsible for overseeing the funds, and since he passed away, no one could access the funds that he previously maintained. So the normal procedure was that uh, Quadriga, CX, uh, founder and CEO, Gerald Cotton, would move the majority of the coins to cold storage as a way to protect the coins from hacking. So Robertson has hired a consultant to attempt to decrypt the laptop utilized by Cotton to potentially gain access to the private keys to the cold storage wallets that kept Quadriga CX's user funds. And the consultant has not found success in obtaining access to the laptop. And to date, the exchange has not been able to recover any of the funds. So basically, a uh, big problem here, $190 million, um, and they're a little insolvent right now. So they face an unfortunate series of events that left the company with a limited selection of decisions to, make, to protect its investors. But the system uh, employed by the exchange allowed one executive in the company to exercise total control over user funds led to the loss of hundreds of millions of dollars, and it could have prevented with a well-structured internal management system. So right now, uh, anybody that wants to, you know, get their crypto off the exchange, they might just have to use hot funds, which is essentially probably other people's funds. So if you had maybe a million dollars in Bitcoin or something on this exchange and you're like, hey, I would like to cash out now, they're going to be unable to do that. Or if you would like to be like, hey, I'd like to move this uh, million dollars in Bitcoin to another exchange or to a different wallet, they're not going to be able to do that. The only way that they could do that is use hot funds, which is probably collectively other users' funds to move yours, um, and then they wouldn't be able to move theirs. So a major problem, and I think sort of the first of its kind, although this isn't the first time in history that somebody has forgotten their keys or been able to uh, unable to access their crypto after losing private uh, private keys or anything like that but uh, probably the biggest blunder of exchanges we've seen in in a little while aside from maybe cryptopia losing all of their private keys to a hacker which deleted their private keys and then stole them <clears throat> and then now he's able to uh, withdraw everybody that uh, uh, unloads to uh, uh, cryptopia so very interesting story <clears throat> Um, and so only one person solely in control, and then he passed away, unfortunately, and now uh, nobody can get to it. So one of the most wacky stories I think I've read in, in, in a good while. Um, but uh, moving on here, Bitcoin is now officially in its longest bear market ever. So I mentioned a few days ago that uh, soon, on February 1st or 2nd, yeah, 2nd, uh, that... Um, if it makes it to that date without being a bull market, whatever you would consider that to be, uh, it's going to be the longest bear market in history. And the one previous to that was like 2013, 14 sort of deal or 14 to 15, something like that. It was like 400 and some days. 
So we've officially entered the longest stretch of declining prices in its 10-year history. The world's oldest and most valuable currency achieved 20000 December 17, and, uh, and has printed a series of lower price highs ever since. As such, uh, Bitcoin's longest stretch surpasses the duration of the infamous 2013 to 2015 Bitcoin bear market, which spanned 410 days from its Price, uh, from its high to its low. Um, indeed, Bitcoin's most recent stretch of declining prices is the longest in duration ever witnessed by the cryptocurrency, but has yet to become the worst in total in terms of total depreciation. Um, I think the worst in, de in total depreciation was when it went from exactly from its high from thirty one to two dollars, uh, which is ninety three percent, and then um, in twenty thirteen to fifteen it fell eighty six percent. So uh, right now, with its its price around thirty four hundred, it's like an eighty two percent decline. Only an eighty two percent decline. So no one can be certain uh, if or when Bitcoin's record decline will come to an end. But whether it uh, uh, be the market's subdued response to the withdrawal of highly anticipated Bitcoin exchange traded funds or what, uh, so backed and ETFs may be on the way. Institutions are coming. I feel like this is Game of Thrones at this point, where oh the dragons are coming, like oh the zombies are coming, oh the the, the dragons are coming, and then it's season seven, and then it's like hey we're here, and then oh crap you got to wait two years for the uh, for the final season so it's kind of like that uh real parallels there uh, institutions are coming oh no they're coming they're coming i'm not a big fan of institutionalization of bitcoin it seems like sort of the opposite of what bitcoin should be it should just be like for the people mining and then used sort of underground if you will as a store of value and a store of transfer over the internet but uh i suppose whatever is going to raise the prices so i think the institutionalization will raise the prices uh, back Backed May, uh, there's going to be some hype before backed, but uh, other than that, um, not too much on the radar in terms of hype aside from that, which, uh, again, those are pretty uncertain. So Wyoming recognizes cryptocurrencies as money. So this has been going around quite a bit, and there has been articles before that where they were going to vote to make its uh, official money in that state, and so it has. So the American state, Wyoming, passed a bill that will recognize cryptocurrencies as money on January 31st. And uh, Wyoming, interestingly enough, is, uh, uh, I don't know if it's the, I think it's the, the least dense in terms of population contiguous United States uh, state, uh, maybe Alaska, but uh, Wyoming, uh, like nobody lives in Wyoming. And interestingly enough, Wyoming is the gun capital of the United States. The most guns per uh, per household is in Wyoming. And the next one is Washington, D.C., interestingly enough, which is not really a state, it's more of a city state, but uh, we won't get into that. So Wyoming is a weird statistical anomaly of states in the United States. So now, uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, cryptos and Bitcoin gain more traction every day all around the world. The United States of America is no exception. However, some states are more crypto friendly than others. Um, the, uh, the state of Ohio was the first to accept cryptocurrencies as taxes. I think uh, Florida and Arizona did too at some point. I remember reading articles on that, but uh, we'll, we'll, I digress on that. Taxes on items from cigarette sales to employee taxes will be able to pay uh, with Bitcoin. So, Ohio was the first state to accept cryptocurrencies as taxes for businesses, so it's kind of like cigarette sales to employee taxes. Um, the scheme is set to be rolled out for individual taxes at an unspecified future date. So another state that wants to become the foremost crypto blockchain is Wyoming. A few uh, weeks ago, they passed two bills to incentivize blockchain businesses to open shop in the state. And the two bills focus on bringing digital tokens under legal frameworks governing assets on specifics um, that blockchain tokens are an intangible personal property. The plan is that they do not need an exception from federal securities law. So Wyoming uh, moving on ahead. And so, again, Bitcoin all over the world is gaining a lot more traction in a lot of ways, um, you know, from Venezuela buying it in mass because of their hyperinflation to these various uh, states in, in the United States to be able to accept them and pay your business taxes or just taxes in general. And that sort of solidifies Bitcoin as actual money uh, because, you know, before that, people kind of said that, hey, money is... 
you know, anything that provides a source of value and a store of value that you can just, you know, transfer from one person to another. And, you know, a sort of another definition of money is, well, your government makes the money and it's mostly central bankers, which aren't governments, but uh, let's just go with governments. Your governments make the money and then you can pay your taxes in government. So that legitimizes it. So like now if your government accepts it, it legitimizes it as a currency. I could pay my taxes. I can do this in, in my currency. And the more states that uh, allow Bitcoin uh, or other cryptocurrencies to be paid in taxes really truly legitimizes them as actual money instead of just um, their usual government MO that it's only good for, you know, uh, outlaws and people who do illegal things on the dark web or whatever. So moving on to the next article here, uh, this is kind of interesting in, in a few ways. So Twitter CEO uh, to Joe Rogan, I think uh, cryptocurrency will be the internet, or uh, will be the the, the currency of the internet will be Bitcoin. Wow, I can't believe I messed that up so bad. So um, Jack Dorsey appeared on the Joe Rogan podcast. It has over 4.4 million subscribers, and Dorsey stated his conviction that the internet was evolving towards a native currency. Um, so commenting, he said, I believe the internet will have a native currency, and I don't know if it's Bitcoin, but I think it will be Bitcoin, given all the tests it's been through and the principles behind it, how it was created. It was something that was born on the internet, was developed on the internet, was tested on the internet. And it is of the internet. So I think <clears throat> this is good for Bitcoin, of course, uh, you know, when, when celebrities and CEOs and people talk about this on really uh, watched podcasts like this, of course. But I think at the same time, it doesn't even need to be said that it was created by the internet. I don't think like Jack Dorsey necessarily needs to endorse Bitcoin or talk about Bitcoin to legitimize Bitcoin. It's been around for 10 years now. And, you know, he says, oh, it was created on the Internet. It was something that was born on the Internet. Of course it was. You don't really need to say that to legitimize it. Uh, another weird thing about this podcast was that the majority of commentators, um, you know, in the comment section below it, uh, really, really dislike Jack Dorsey. Everybody says, like, terrible things. Um, and, you know what, I almost have to agree because uh, Twitter lately has become a liberal uh, wasteland. Uh, anybody with sort of a right mindset, uh, right wing, mindset and i don't mean like far right or anything like that those people uh you can die in a fire i don't know but uh you know i'm talking about republican or democrat liberal or conservative kind of thing and um you know a lot of conservative speakers have been removed from the twitter platform and you know and they they sort of give a voice to this liberal attitude which is really weird and very biased um so it doesn't really matter what your bias is working at twitter it's not really your job to just filter through as long as people aren't being outright hateful or you know threats or something like that or, or blatantly racist or anything like that that would actually ban you that would be a, a part of their terms of service but their terms of service doesn't really state like hey you can't be you know, Republican on this platform. Uh, so I think a lot of people have, t have been pretty angry about that, about how Twitter is extremely biased. And uh, the, the amount of comments against Jack Dorsey on this is, is absolutely astonishing. As I uh, watched a little bit of it the other day. Now, um, another thing that was sort of weird about this podcast is that it was taken down. And I, I don't think it, uh, I, I don't think it made it to the end of the podcast. And it just sort of died. It just went down just as uh, people were talking about on the podcast, how they were talking about that it will disrupt governments and things like that. And I don't mean to throw out a conspiracy here that the, the CIA turned it off or something like that. But it was really weird that as soon as they started talking about how it was going to disrupt governments and things like that, that their podcast just ended. Uh, the podcast is, uh, unlisted on YouTube right now. So if you have the link, you can actually still see it. But interestingly enough, it seems like it was like a re-upload of some sort, um, just unlisted, because now it doesn't have any likes or dislikes. It was sort of wiped out its likes and dislikes. So I think it got like overly disliked. Maybe they shut it down and re-uploaded it to, to like separate the likes to just sort of reshuffle it back to zero um, or somebody shut them down or maybe they just had internet connection troubles but it was really weird and some people are talking about that um, you know on, on forums and reddits and, and in the comments and things like that so it's really interesting uh, how they shut this down but it's not like they were talking about anything that like maybe a government or anybody doesn't really know uh, that Bitcoin could disrupt this sort of thing um, so again, it was okay, uh, the, the podcast, but um, th there's something a little bit weird about Jack Dorsey. His eye contact is a little weird. It's never quite 
never quite there where it needs to be. And uh, he's just a very weird guy. Uh, and it screams uh, heavy liberal. And it really makes sense why conservatives on Twitter um, are, are banned um, a lot lately. Uh, when you listen to Jack Dorsey, he, it really makes a lot of sense. Uh, whether you are liberal or conservative yourself, it doesn't really matter. You can kind of see it either way. Uh, so moving on, um, this isn't an article, but it is pretty cool. I do plan on putting this link um, in the description below. So you guys can take a look at this. It's kind of just interesting to look at. It's eye candy, if you will. So it's Bitcoin prehistory. Bitcoin did not come out of the blue. It's not a fad. It's the result of 40 years of research, development, and demand. <clears throat> So we can see all the way back in 1973, there's the uh, TCP IP uh, protocol uh, developed. Um, so, and then moving on, you know, new directions in cryptography. It's just a lot of really interesting things, um, you know, and even in 1983 here, we have, uh, you know, in 1981, we have untraceable electronic mail, return addresses and digital pseudonyms. And then, you know, moving on from there, it's blind signatures and untraceable payments, uh, elliptic curve cryptography. Um, and it just keeps on going on and on. And eventually uh, there's DigiCash in 1989, Cyber Cash in 1994. Um, we have eGold, uh, NSA, How to Make a Mint in 1996. Um, and it just goes on and on. It, it goes into Nick Sabo talking about, um, you know, making BitGold in 1998 and, uh, and on and on and on. And then we have BitTorrent, distributed hash tables and video game currencies and uh, markets. Uh, demand started um, in about 2001. And, um, and then it goes into Hal Finney's reusable proof of work paper in 2004. Um, and then we have the Lehman Bank uh, bankruptcy. And then on October 31st is when Sat Satoshi Nakamoto actually um, made the, I, I believe it was on October 31st that he made the Bitcoin dot, uh, dot org, uh, or was it dot com um, website. And then it was, a, it was a little later that the white paper was released on it. And then um, in January 3rd, 2009, just a few months later, uh, was when Bitcoin was actually released. So it's really interesting how, um, you know, all the cryptography led up to this point and that, that Bitcoin was the first. And like, yes, it was. But you can see that CyberCash was in 94, uh, DigiCash in 1989. But none of these really took off or really uh, some of them didn't uh, take off at all and were just made mostly concepts that failed. E gold, uh, you know, Nick Sabo's uh, Bit Gold and, and things like that. And Way Dies, B Money in 1998, a, a decentralized database to record transactions and use a type of proof of work. So, really interesting. Even like the government, NSA, how to make a mint, uh, how to make a digital currency. Um, and, you know, there's, a, there's a, still a lot of. Uh, mystery behind the creation of, of Bitcoin. And either it was as simple as uh, a group of people or a number of people, perhaps even Hal Finney and Nick Sabo working together, maybe even Wei Dai, uh, maybe even uh, Craig Wright, um, you know, and, um, you know, many others in that as well. Um, the guy's the name that I always forget that uh, died at his computer and um, was working on it just before. But uh, so it's likely a group of people talking to each other, maybe one main person that was consulting with all of the other people that had created these other things like Bitcoin and, and B money and things like that. Or, um, you know, maybe it was that simple. And it was just one person that just took all these ideas that were made a few years before and then compiled them and made Bitcoin. Or was it really the NSA that made Bitcoin? Uh, as, as crazy as that sounds, some people think that's the case because SHA-256 is made by the NSA. SHA-2 uh, was the original um idea and then 256 and 512 and things like that are like just levels of encryption and so SHA-256 was indeed made by the NSA as, as crazy as that is um, it was um, and then sort of publicized so that other people could use it so it's just such a mystery where Bitcoin came from and I, I really like this chart so I wanted to show it to you guys and uh, maybe put it in the link below so you guys can take a look at it as well and then maybe you can look up some of these people and what they created and, and talk about that and, and read up on, on these individual people and stuff like that. 
So moving on uh, to coin market cap, we are at a hundred fourteen billion dollar market cap, still at three thirty four eighty eight Bitcoin. So not really any change. We're just trading sideways for quite some time here. Um, the Bitcoin SV community is pretty in shock about how their currency is going way down. Uh, I urge you to go onto the Bitcoin uh, SV Reddit and uh, just mm, 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 check out that drama that's going on right now. Real good stuff. Um, but uh, really interesting. EO still uh, number four and Bitcoin Cash got dunked down to number five. But you can see they're not really that far away from each other. It's, you know, 20 million, uh, 23 million or so at best there um, of a difference. But um Bitcoin dominance at 53.4%, so still not going anywhere. Altcoin's going down a little significantly compared to Bitcoin. Bitcoin's still holding its mark there, holding strong. Um, but that's all I have for you guys today. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and like the video. That helps me out a lot. My social media in the description below, my Twitter, my Steam, my Twitch. Give me a follow on there if you get the opportunity. Um, but um, as usual... I will see you guys next time.